thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to open our briefing today by acknowledging that we're calling in from different locations in what we now call the state of California, which is home to many indigenous communities that have stewarded this land since time immemorial. Uh, my name is Bree Lindsay. I'm the Director of Science Services and filling in for our Deputy Director who started this briefing. And I'll introduce CCST, our Disaster Resilience Initiative, and then I will welcome our moderator for this briefing, Dr. Eric Hoke. The California Council on Science and Technology is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that was established 35 years ago at the request of the legislature. CCST has created, was created to provide science and technology advice from the wealth of outstanding academic and research institutions in our state directly to policymakers. Uh, California is so lucky to have such an incredible network of expertise, and our job here is to help amplify and translate the expertise in this network into actionable advice for policymakers. We do this through a number of different mechanisms, including the briefings like the one you're attending today. We host workshops, we write peer-reviewed reports, and we run the CCST Science Fellows Program, where we pay, place PhD scientists and engineers in the executive branch and the legislature for a year of government service and leadership training. As part of our mission, CCST is advancing work related to our disaster resilience initiative to help the state better prepare for and respond to the ongoing complex and intersecting disasters that affect public health, our economy, and our environment. These include climate change, extreme heat, power outages, and the COVID-19 pandemic, which are all radically disrupting the ways in which Californians live and work. While these disruptive while these disruptions are actually quite destructive and painful, they can also provide us opportunities to redesign our systems to be more resilient and sustainable. And through our Disaster Resilience Initiative, we are seeking to deliver science and technology advice to reduce harm and improve the lives of all Californians. Today, we're focusing on how innovations in de desalination technology could help improve California's resilience to drought. And so I'd like now to introduce our excellent moderator, Dr. Eric Hoke. Eric is a professor at UCLA and the faculty director of UCLA's Sustainable LA Grand Challenge, a campus-wide initiative in partnership with the city of LA to keep to help LA become the world's most sustainable megacity by 2050. Eric is an engineer by training. His research focuses on nanomaterials, membrane technology, and electrochemistry with a focus on water, energy, and environmental applications. Eric also brings an industry perspective, having co-founded several technology companies focused on producing innovative membrane technologies for water treatment, desalination, and recycling. We're grateful to have you with us here today, Eric, and thank you so much for bearing with our technical difficulties. Thank you. Hey, Bree. Thank you. Uh, good to be working with you again. Uh, as we all know, California is currently facing what will likely be a fourth year of historic drought conditions. Uh, as climate change threatens California's and, and much of the world's freshwater supplies, the state of California is challenged with identifying new approaches for water resilience. Uh, desalination is, of course, not new. The first commercially viable reverse osmosis membrane was invented and, uh, and patented by UCLA in 1960. And the first modern desalination plant in California was built over three decades ago on Catalina Island. But new technological developments are changing the conversation about desalination's possible role in the state's water portfolio. Today, I'm joined by four other experts, all working on the cutting edge of desalination research. I'm gonna uh, invite them to introduce themselves, uh, their expertise, uh, and a specific desalination challenge that they're they're working on uh, right now. Uh, Sunny uh, Jang from UC Irvine, can you please uh, kick us off? Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Sunny Jiang. I'm professor at the Civil Environmental Engineering at UC Irvine. Uh, my research focuses on water quality engineering treatment. Um, I also serve as the Associate Director for Water Energy Nexon Center at UCI, and I also affiliated with the uh, NAUI. You will hear that many times today. Um, I worked with the NAUI National Alliance for Water Innovation as a cartographer for uh, ocean desalination to produce uh, municipal drinking water. 
Thank you, Eric. Great to be here. Thank you, Sonny. Uh, David Sedlak from UC Berkeley. Can you go next? Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm David Sedlak, a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley and director of the Berkeley Water Center. Um, for the past 25 years, a lot of my research has been focused on potable water reuse um, and the technologies that are enabling a transformation of our uh, our water systems from being a linear system to being one where we recycle most of the wastewater we produce in our cities. Uh, as uh, in the last few years, I've gotten much more interested in desalination and I've taken a role in NAWI, the organization that Sunny just mentioned as the lead cartographer, which means I was in charge of leading the research roadmap. And I'm conducting research these days on uh, on brackish water desalination and questions related to treatment of the brine or concentrate from desalination systems. Uh, one of my observations from my time working on potable water reuse is that new technologies often undergo a process of legitimization where the public has to make a decision about whether they think it's the right thing to do. And having lived through the legitimization of potable water reuse, I understand the importance of uh, academic researchers, professional scientists, uh, utilities and regulators coming together to conduct research that's needed to support decisions about investments in future water infrastructure. And I think this is a great time to come together and think about the process through which uh, desalination undergoes the legitimization process. Thank you, David. Uh, Megan Motter from uh, Stanford University, can you... Uh introduce yourself now. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, my name is Megan Motter. I serve as the research director for the National Alliance for Water Innovation, and I'm also an associate professor at Stanford University in the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Um, my work has focused on water desalination um, throughout my career, working both on new technologies for desalination challenges, including improved membrane design, improved processes for brine concentration, um, and alternative approaches to precision separations in the desalination space, um, and has further evolved into thinking about how we sustainably incorporate desalination into our water supply portfolios. Um, I have a special interest in thinking about how we integrate uh, water infrastructure and electricity infrastructure, and I think that that's a key area of importance um, as we both seek to secure our water supplies and decarbonize uh, the, the California um, sort of economy. Thanks, Megan. And last but definitely not least, uh, Reza uh, Lackey from uh, Cal State. Uh, Polly Pomona, uh, can you introduce yourself? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Reza Lake. I'm an associate professor um, and coordinator of the graduate program at um, California State Polytechnic University in Pomona. Uh, I, was, I was formerly a postdoctoral uh, fellow at uh, UCLA before joining Cal Poly where I uh, was researching in renewable energy and energy storage systems. And since moving to uh, Cal Poly as a, a professor, I uh, started researching in the field of water. Uh, we had some efforts on uh, gray water reuse, decentralized gray water reuse systems that try to um, you know, give another life to wastewater that is not very polluted with organic waste. Uh, we also recently tried to, um, you know, work on a technology that can convert the unwanted byproduct of desalination in something that can reduce the cost of energy storage systems. As we will talk a lot today, desalination uh, does have its own benefits, but it does come with, you know, unwanted byproducts that uh, we need to address. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. So I'm going to provide a few definitions to, to get us started and then ask some prepared questions to get our panel warmed up. And while I'm doing that and throughout the panel, please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions you have along with your name and affiliation. So uh, 
first, desalination is a separation process where salts are removed from a saline water source. And this results in two new streams. One, which is a freshwater stream, the, the portion of the water that passes through uh, an RO membrane, reverse osmosis. And that's typically potable quality. Uh, and an even saltier stream that we call brine or concentrate. So brine management is a major concern in nearly all desalination applications. Second, uh, for this panel, we consider both seawater and brackish, water, brackish groundwater desalination as possible solutions to enhance our drought resilience. And I think we all know what is seawater, but specifically, it varies in salinity from about 3% to about 4% uh, salts, depending on where you are around the planet. And brackish water is water that's saltier than drinking water, which should be less than 0.05% or 500 parts per million salt and all the way up to the lower end of seawater salinity. Reza, can you get us started by just describing how does modern desalination work? Well, as you mentioned, Eric, uh, desalination is a separation process in which uh, the water that includes an acceptable amount of impurities, both, both organic and non-organic, uh, is either pushed through a membrane by a pressure-driven pressure process or, or separated uh, by, by thermal processes to uh, a flow of water, which is you know, potable. It does have limited amount of impurities. And another stream that is going to have you know, all the unwanted uh, minerals and uh, you know, organic content in it, which uh, we will need to um, safely dispose. So the problem of disposal of that brine is more obvious if you are away from the coast. So near coastal areas, since we have access to a wide body of water, which is already uh, has a high salinity, but at much less values, we can use that to dilute this water, this unwanted uh, concentrate to levels that doesn't harm the environment. Um, so this is also subject to a lot of debates and you know, discussions in the academic academy. There are papers that support um, you know, uh, this method of disposals. There are others that show concerns. So th there is no clear indication uh, for that. But the problem is more clear when you are trying to desalinate brackish and surface water uh, in the locations that do not have access to that large body of water. So if you consider the Midwest of the United States, there is no access to, uh, to any body of water. And that area has uh, potentials for brackish water. Uh, however, due to absence of this disposal mechanism, uh, the capacity has not grown to the level that it can. Thank you, Reza. That was great. Uh, Megan, desalin desalination is often described as being very expensive. Can you give us a sense of how expensive is it and, and why? What makes the process so, so costly? I was muted. Uh, sure, Eric. I think it's important to think about desalination as part of a water supply portfolio. So when we turn to, uh, say, the city of San Diego and we ask how much are they paying for their desalinated water, um, it's put in perspective uh, with the broader water supply portfolio, um, which accounts for the vast majority of the water supplied uh, to that municipality. Uh, we can think about all sorts of different water sources that the city of San Diego uses, conservation, surface water, groundwater, imported water, recycled potable water, recycled non-potable water, and then finally seawater desal. And so um, when we think across that cost spectrum, um, some of those earlier sources I mentioned are going to be lower cost, somewhere between $500 and $1,000 an acre foot. Um, and some of those later ones, especially recycled potable um, and desalinated water are going to be um, closer to $2,000 an acre foot on average. Um, I think it's also really important to understand that a lot of the costs that we're seeing, especially in new bids for desal builds, um, are very dependent on a, a couple of site specific factors. So. Um, especially in California, the, the two um, recent uh, seawater RO uh, proposals are very similar in size. So they're about um, 5 MGD, 
but they are really different in terms of cost. One is at about $2,000 an acre foot, and one is about $6,000 an acre foot. Um, and we're seeing that discrepancy because of things like, is the land available? Um, how much water transport do we have to do from the desal site um, to the end use? Do we have to build uh, a long pipeline, which is really expensive? Um, and do we have a sort of, what's the contracting mechanism? Do we have a build, own, operate? Do we have a design, build? Um, I, so there's a lot of nuance um, that goes into the origins of those costs, but I think it's important to understand that in, in most cases, we're seeing desalination really as a marginal water supply that would provide somewhere between five and 10% of a municipality's you know, water source um, and so the costs should be amortized also over that full water supply portfolio and uh, looked at relative to the other sources that are available. Thanks, Megan. That was really helpful. Uh, Sunny, can you talk about what are the environmental impacts associated with desalination and can they be mitigated and how can they be mitigated? Sure. Um, well, I will uh, follow up on Megan. She said uh, it's energy, very expensive. And those, um, I would say the number one environmental issue actually is the energy consumption is the carbon footprint. It's when we use all those energy to produce water, we generate a lot of greenhouse gas. That's the number one uh, environmental concern. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is because there's no short-term solution to mitigate that energy that required to separate the water and salt. Um, so I think we have a little discussion about the technology. I won't go into that um, right now, but I know everybody who is interested in desalination heard about this debate about brine discharge and heard about the debate of you know, impingement and entrainment of uh, juvenile fish and then degradation of ecosystem. Let me address the brine discharge. And as you heard from Reza already, um, inland uh, brine discharge is a huge deal because there's a no safe place. There's no nice place. There's no easy place to um, put that brine, which is double amount of salt, at least for seawater, and there's a whole bunch of other chemicals in it, you don't have a place to put it. Um, my expertise is on more seawater desalination. I do understand there's a lot of in, uh, environmental concern about brine discharge, and there's some permitting problem with discharge of uh, brines through ocean outfalls. It is true, if you discharge twice as concentrated salt and back to the ocean um, without any engineered technology, you may cause this called a inversion of the density so that the, the brine will settle on the seafloor and then do not mix well with the upper portion of the ocean. You cause a zone that is very salty. But now we have the technology. We can mitigate that by using the diffuser technology. They require this long perforated pipe and going into the ocean before you discharge. The hydrodynamic mixing between the salt water and the um, ambient water is continuous as the water piping out into the ocean. Such mixing will change the, uh, the salinity dramatically. And there's many research have been done in the recent years to look at the brine discharge to understand the ecological impact of that. I, I know a lot of desalination, especially ocean desalination, people are interested in the coastal environment. I just uh, came back from University of Hawaii, actually, and then there is a big ocean out uh, pipe. It's not for desalination, but for power plant cooling. That is a famous scuba dive and snorkel site because as a pipe where you have the, it's called the electric power plant uh, site has tons of fish. If you want to see fish, you go there to scuba dive, to snorkel. And we worried about the thermal contamination. We worried about all the uh, power plant cooling water to damage the ecosystem. And as long as I see there wasn't any uh, 
uh, bearing land in that area, there is most amount of fish. So that is my answer about uh, brine discharge. And there is um, mitigation technology as long as our permitting require those uh, diffusers, and then we are able to um, overcome the ocean, ocean discharge of brine. But without the diffusers, yes, those are environmental impact. About impingement and entrainment, and maybe people are heard a lot about sucking up the baby fish when you are pulling in seawater for desalination. There are also technologies and then uh, developed to uh, deter the fish from going into those vents. And there's also a lot of video uh, uh, recording with the online cameras to seeing how the fish behave around the, um, the intake um, of the area of the uh, desalination intake. Um, so I think uh, research are in there, technology are in there to help us to mitigate those uh, environmental impact that many people are concerned just because in the early phase of the ocean desalination, we are not truly understand those technology and those impact yet. And the, pro, uh, the activity from the environmental group has really promote such development. I'll stop there and move back to you, Eric. Yeah, that was great. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think everybody, um, oh, David, I have one last question I, I'd like you to um, take a shot at. So how do you see desalination fitting into the broader portfolio of water resilience strategies uh, for the state of California? Thanks, Eric. Um, I think we've already heard a little bit uh, from Megan about this idea that desalination is one part of a water portfolio. And I think the best way to think about that water portfolio is to consider the contribution that desalination currently makes to California's water systems, the likelihood that it will grow in the future, and the importance of desalination in the places where it's actually been implemented. So starting with uh, the current state of desalination, desalination is primarily being used in the urban water sector. So it, it's being used for cities, usually cities uh, along the coast, but some inland cities. And currently our seawater desalination plants produce uh, about a little less than about 0.1 million acre feet per year. So you hear this unit again, a million acre feet per year. To put that into perspective, all of the urban water use in California is about 7 million acre feet per year. So it's a little less than, it's around 1% or even less. If all of the proposed desalination plants that have been floated in the last decade were to be built, that would almost double it. So it would only be about 2%. Looking at brackish desalination, the use of desalination in an inland community, which is uh, increasingly common in Southern California and some dry parts of the Central Valley. It's about half of what current desalination is today, about 0 0.05 million acre feet per year. So this is uh, a relatively small amount. And if we compare it to the amount of water, uh, for example, needed for agriculture, which is you know upwards of 30 million acre feet per year, it's extremely small. So why are we talking about desalination? Why all the discussion about desalination? Primarily because if you don't have other sources of water, desalination can be a lifeline. And so we've seen in places like Santa Barbara where they recently built the desalination plant because they had uh, junior water rights and were kind of at the, the end of the pipeline with respect to the state's water supply. Desalination was incredibly important uh, because it provided uh, some certainty that the city could get through extended periods of drought. Likewise, in smaller cities like Fort Bragg and Cambria, where desalination plants were instrumental in helping the, the towns and cities ride out the last uh, drought. And so where we see the importance of desalination for California's water portfolio is in the places where there are either junior water rights and no other good sources of water that are, haven't already been exploited, where conservation has already been implemented, and where there are limited opportunities for water recycling. And so in the portfolio, there's a real desire among these communities to have 
desalination as one of the tools in their arsenal for consideration. That was really great, David. Um, I think we're all warm now, and I think I'm uh, I'm going to go to uh, uh, some of the Q and A uh, questions that have been submitted. Um, the first one that's up is from Carl Longley from the California Water Institute at Fresno State. Hi, Carl. Um, he asked, what are your views on the future of inland desalination, particularly on brine disposal options? Uh, I'm going to open it up to uh, the panel. I'm going to say uh, maybe let Megan speak first, and then whoever wants to jump in afterwards, feel free. Great. Um, so, you know, I think that the um, future of inland uh, desalination definitely depends on a future innovation in reducing the cost and energy intensity of that concentrate stream management. Um, there are some places where there is um, easy disposal of that concentrate. Uh, oftentimes that is in um, subsurface wells, basically injecting it um, into deep strata. And that works in places like Texas. Um, there's a lot of uh, brine concentrate that is injected uh, in Texas and, and in other places where you have good injection, um, sort of good geology for injection. Um, that is not uh, universally true across the state of California. Um, and I would say that you know, a key um, and, and very important research focal point is in developing brine concentration technologies that help us efficiently move from the you know, roughly 50,000 parts per million TDS or 50 gram per liter concentrate uh, vol uh, uh, concentration all the way up to um, something that approaches uh, either a saturation point uh, so a brine saturation where you're starting to go crystals or all the way up to a solid product. Um, there's a lot of potential pathways to get there. And the National Alliance for Water Innovation, where I serve as research director, which is housed at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, um, is very focused on this question of how do we develop new technologies to efficiently help us concentrate brine, but also um, derive value from that concentrated brine. Um, so that brine has um, the potential to become uh, feed streams and other industrial processes. It has the potential to help us source um, specific elements that, that we may be interested in. Um, and I think broadly, we need to be looking at place-based solutions for brine management um, that account for existing disposal pathways, um, existing subsurface geology, um, and existing markets uh, that a concentrate might uh, feed into. I'll pass it over to David Thank if you, you yeah, David, David wants to add. Look like you want to yeah. jump in, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, so first, hi, Carl. Uh, nice nice to have you with us here today. Um, I just wanted to mention one more option that may enable uh, inland brine uh, desalination, especially in California, and those are brine lines. So there is a pipeline which carries water from the Inland Empire to, uh, to a discharge point off the coast of Southern California, and it has been instrumental in enabling desalination in that part of the state. And as you're aware, through your work with CV Salts, there's been consideration of the idea of uh, brine lines in other parts of the state to uh, take advantage of the idea that once you concentrate the salts, you might be able to move them long distances. And so um, I think that in addition, we may see opportunities, especially in the uh, populated parts of Southern California to think about how we can more efficiently use uh, our existing infrastructure for this. For example, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have the Livermore Valley where they have a long pipeline which takes uh, their sewage affluent all the way to San Francisco Bay for discharge. And part of the reason was they didn't wanna leave the salts from the sewage affluent in the, the basin. That is slowly turning into a brine line as more and more desalination happens in the Livermore Valley. So there's another opportunity here to think about uh, some of our uh, infrastructure that lets us use surface water disposal uh, of these brines after appropriate treatment to, uh, to enable uh, an even less expensive way of, of managing brine. I'll just add on that and say that um, these brine lines are um, increasingly volume limited though. 
And so if we're going to make good use of the existing infrastructure we have, it's actually going to require a combination of um, concentrate uh, technology. So pushing that brine to higher and higher concentrations and thus reducing its volume, um, as well as leveraging new infrastructure and, and potentially building new infrastructure, uh, as David mentioned. Razor, go ahead, yeah. Reza, I think you're still muted. You gotta unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, so regarding that pipeline that delivers the uh, brine in Southern California, I know that the cost of using that is a burden for desalination plants. Um, and also, um, you know, the, regarding the uh, disposal of uh, the brine in uh, areas that is far from the coast, inland desalination, I think development of technologies that, you know, desalinate water to almost, uh, you know, solid zero liquid discharge technologies, they can be very important to, you know, extract more water. And at the end, the reject of that process is a solid that can be repurposed on, in different in applications for, you know, energy storage or for construction, as an example. Uh, the other topic I wanted to briefly touch on was uh, about the safeness of disposing the brine in the ocean. I know we talked about that. Um, I think this really depends on a variety of reasons because we're talking about a biological ecosystem um, and the you know, local salinity of water and the design of the diffusers um, may impact the, you know, the outcome of, 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 of our design in the long run. So if you look at the research studies on diffusers, uh, many of them or many advanced, advancements are happening in the current decade. And this may or may not be enough time for an ecosystem to respond. It's not, it's outside my expertise, but it, it kind of bothers me that we don't know enough about this topic. Thanks, Reza. Um, <clears throat> I know in, in Southern California, the two brine lines we call sorry lines are um, a great asset. Uh, they're also either fully or almost fully allocated. So there's not a lot of room for additional new brine sources to be fed in and then safely discharged to the ocean. So that does, um, it, it solved the historical problem, but it's not the solution going forward. And I saw a map recently of what Southern California looked like when those pipelines were installed. And it, the population was a fraction of what it is now. And it was mostly dirt and undeveloped land that the pipes were laid through. And, but now there are neighborhoods and business districts and industry all, all surrounding them. And so to, to do that again would be almost incomprehensively uh, expensive, it just unbelievably expensive. So, um, but in other places, you know, there may be opportunities, as David said, to um, to, to build new pipelines to to help manage. Um, I see Jim Hawley from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Hi, Jim. Uh, has asked, can you discuss the potential for small scale modular designs and their applicability to smaller communities? So I think I'm going to ask David to speak first, and then again, whoever else wants to jump in, feel free. So one of the the really exciting places to think about desalination having an impact is on uh, small communities where which are among the most vulnerable uh, here in California and pretty much around the world. So when you look at uh, at California, there are close to a million people who are relying upon wells who are at risk of running out of water during droughts or are currently being uh, accessing water that's contaminated with uh, constituents that are hazardous to their health like nitrate or arsenic. And desalination is a technology that has is inherently modular. The, the membranes that are used in a, a large uh, seawater desalination plant uh, and the membranes used in a brackish water plant are very similar to the ones that are used in a small scale system that could be applied at the level of a cluster of homes, a small community, or even an individual well. And so the historic challenge in doing that 
Uh, there have been, been a number of them, and, and I don't know that we have time to go into all of them in detail. We're starting to address some of them in NAWI, but being able to make these modular systems autonomous, being able to assure that the maintenance is simple, that they're safe to use, and that they're also um, not rejecting large quantities of water. So historically, the under the sink uh, reverse osmosis units that people use are operated at uh, at uh, very low water recoveries, which means that in some cases for every uh, liter of water they produce, they're wasting a liter because they're, they're not run up near their uh, operating limits because it's hard to add antiscalants and there's a lot of concerns about possibly uh, fouling the membranes. So there's currently like right now you could deploy a small scale desalination system that relies upon reverse osmosis or another technology to a household well or a cluster of homes or a small community. They just happen to be relatively expensive. But by focusing on the best ways of using sensors, changing the materials used in membranes, uh, working on pretreatment, et cetera, we think that there's a, a path to, to lowering that cost and making it the go-to option when we think about uh, protecting communities from uh, from threats of water contamination and also being able to access uh, brackish water resources. And I think there are a lot of people in this panel who probably have things to add to that. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in and say that the California Department of Water Resources has also been very pivotal in helping to support NAWI's efforts to pilot some technologies in small inland communities, um, especially technologies that aren't necessarily membrane based. So some of the um, some of the water contamination issues in these small communities um, are not exclusively um, issues with total dissolved solids. Uh, they can be issues with nitrates, for instance, or with arsenic. And so Maui has been piloting um, and, and will begin to pilot um, some technologies that are really designed to be small scale systems that serve communities uh, and may or may not be uh, membrane based. So you're not generating the same degree of uh, concentrate that needs to be managed in those inland communities, but are really focused in um, separating the ions of concern and, and are doing so through um, either sorbent or electrochemical based processes. Those are really good points. I see Sunny has her hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I, I see the question because the question also not only for the small uh, packaging system, also asking about renewable energy, how the renewable energy can be integrated into the small plants and packaging plants. I think actually that is a really great question and great addition to the small package plants. And so you reduce the transport of energy. And I don't know if there are any study have done um, um, if there is uh, renewable energy for a small package package plans or household plans. Um, uh, Virgin Islands has a lot of small desalination plants. Um, then they, they none of them are run on renewable energy, but I know very large desalination, uh, des desalination plants in Perth, Australia, they are fully, a lot of them are run on the uh, wind power, renewable energy. Um, so, so I would say um, definitely uh, combining renewable energy with the small plants and definitely is, a, is an interesting area. I don't know how much exploration we have done, so. Yeah, those are also good points. Um, so I think I'm gonna um, go to the next question. And uh, and apologies if I get the pronunciation wrong, but Chris Turnell from the California Department of Water Resources uh, it says the governor's recent water supply strategy directs state agencies, among them the Department of Water Resources, to consider avenues for improving coastal desalination permitting processes by improving, uh, I, I think we mean um, making it take less time uh, and, and, and be less expensive to obtain a permit. Uh, any thoughts on how the technologies you're all working on could help shape that conversation? What technology is coming online that we should be considering as, as part of these conversations? Um, okay, Reza, well, yeah, go ahead. So I just kind of continues with uh, uh, what Sonny discussed about the importance of 
uh, renewable energy for uh, you know the future power uh, supply. So as we know, uh, California aims 2045 to run fully uh, you know on, on on renewable energy, run the power grid under renewable energy, and that will impose a significant amount of demand on uh, energy storage technologies because of the intermittent nature of renewables in the power grid. Uh, this, I think, has a huge potential that can be tied into water desalination uh, because we can consume the energy at the times that is not really needed by other sectors so that we can generate the uh, water for, um, for our applications. David, yeah, please go ahead. I, I think that, you know, the, the question of how to streamlining the permitting process is an important one, but I also think that getting getting it right in these early desalination projects is really important as well. Um, you know, I'm, I don't work directly in the permitting process for ocean desal plants, but as an observer from the outside, it feels to me a lot like the early days of potable water recycling, where every single project is uh, quite different from one another and undergoes a lot of scrutiny uh, uh, almost at the level of a National Academy's panel study and that those take long times and there are differences of opinions and it does delay the process. And so one of the things that uh, CCST and the state might want to consider is actually uh, asking some outside scientists for advice on some of the technical issues that seem to be tripping people up because it does seem like um, every project feels like a, a, a PhD dissertation or even more than that. And it seems that once the state is permitted uh, a half dozen or a dozen projects, the, the permitting process is likely to go a lot faster. And so there needs to be perhaps a strategy that sees uh, additional resources coming into the, uh, the science and technology discussions with the promise that once we've resolved some of these key permitting questions, the applicants will have a better idea of how California views uh, safe uh, and acceptable seawater desalination. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a question from Keith uh, Cialino from uh, the State Assembly's Water Parks and Wildlife Committee. Uh, will the cost per acre foot come down with te technology advancements and the use of renewable energy technologies in the short term? What cost per acre foot might be achievable? And a related question from Sean and Aya from the California Energy Commission. Commission uh, is there a preference, solar, solar thermal, geothermal, offshore wind, in terms of integration with renewable energy technologies? So how, how do... How does the cost curve look uh, near term, long term, and and how does integration with renewable technologies influence the cost curve, uh, and, and which which might be preferred? Yeah, so like Megan wants to to jump in here. Go ahead. I, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, you know, we've actually tended to see desal get more expensive in California, not less expensive in California, and a lot of that is permitting. Um, very little of that is actually energy costs. Um, even though energy costs are going up, uh, the the you know costs of energy relative to the capital costs um, are de minimus. Uh, you know, we're talking somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of your costs of running a desal plant. Um, and and even that depends a lot on you know what is your source water and um, what are the overall kind of intake permitting piping etc costs that just um, are part and parcel of a lot of these big projects. Um, I think that you're going to see costs come down um, when a couple of things happen. The first is when these especially small scale plants become really basically like. Uh, you know, very modular um, in their technology and, and very um, uniform in their deployment schema. I think there's a, a possibility of really moving towards 
package systems that all look the same and kind of get dropped in um, to work for a whole host of different water supply systems. So cutting out a lot of the design costs and, and also seeing um, the economies of scale and manufacturing and deployment um, is going to really help uh, drop some of those costs. Um, I think that for the, the large scale package systems, um, a transition to renewable energy um, is actually a, an opportunity. Um, what we're seeing is that a lot of these existing facilities are signing contracts with um, demand response providers to ensure um, grid stability by curtailing plant operations. And so they're deriving pretty substantial revenue um, on a yearly basis, usually equivalent to about a month or two months of their total energy costs um, to provide demand response services in the times in which the California grid is really stressed. Uh, so that might be six or eight times a year. Um, it's not every day. Uh, but the truth is, we're not really designing for that right now in our plants. And I think there's an enormous opportunity to think about ways in which we are actually building flexibility into these desalination plant designs, um, potentially allowing them to flex their operation much more than six to eight times a year, um, and instead really flex their operation, um, if not on a daily basis, then, then several times a week. The value add to the grid um, especially in displacing the need for things like battery storage um, is tremendous. And I think you know, there's an opportunity in the research um, arena to better articulate what that value is and then also better design plants um, and standardize the design of plants uh, that really allows for high intermittency operation. So smart integration with the grid and the water systems working with the, uh, the power systems in, in concert uh, seems like a win. I'm going to ask uh, maybe Sunny and then Reza if they see any uh, new technologies on the horizon, uh, either new water desalination technologies or energy technologies um, that uh, can further help bring down the costs. Should I go first, Reza? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, um, well, you know, my expertise is mostly on uh, ocean desalination, so I will speak in that front about future technology to potentially cut down on the cost. Um, well, if I focus on the technology part, I do feel that uh, membrane technology have changed our desalination world dramatically, thanks to people like Eric, your your. Uh, your moderator here, and his membrane technology has dramatically reduced the energy cost of separation of the water. And uh, over the past 10 years, we are almost reaching the thermodynamic limit of uh, separating salt and from water. And then, um, so the technology innovation can they dramatically cut down the cost because of the energy of the current system, I will say not the membrane technology um, because we are reaching that limit, but there's other area that we can look into. Um, so the desalination cost in Carlsbad desalination plan is about five times as um, as in um, the plan in Israel. And there's many, many factors in there. You heard from Megan from the very beginning about desalination. There's a lot of those nitty gritty details about location, about transport. And then in the technology front, I do feel like pretreatment to protect those membrane, to enhance the operation, and that helps. And the uh, um, uh, permitting process in the sense of what Megan just talked about, making those small package plant and dropping into the location that need water, that really the optimize the process, the cut down the permitting and all the other paperwork ahead of time, cut down the cost. And then can that same process or be the similar process being applied into the larger uh, ocean desalination permitting process that's also potentially cut down the cost. So cost is very complex a structure, not only technology, but for the technology friend, I do feel like the membrane technology maybe has a little bit room for improvement, but maybe uh, the pre-treatment or, or post-treatment resource recovery potentially offset the cost of desalination. With that, I hand it back to you. Great. Uh, Reza, any 
uh, final words on, on this subject? Yes. Uh, so I am personally uh, excited about uh, zero liquid discharge technologies that uh, I see becoming more and more you know, available um, and using different technologies, mostly thermal driven. So thermal energy is used for uh, that final desalination step to you know, convert the stream of the disposed brine into a solid stream and a liquid stream. And you know, there are a bunch of applications currently being uh, identified for you know, the, the solid salt, uh, including for you know, construction, for extracting minerals um, and all that. Um, the other technology which I see not very growing in the US, but uh, internationally, it seemed to be picking up is uh, solar thermal desalination in which the solar energy is harvested in the form of heat and is used for you know, thermal desalination. So that technology in the US, uh, I don't think is picking up, but worldwide uh, is a subject of new advancements. David, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to maybe challenge the questioner a little with the concept of thinking about water in its cost per cubic meter or acre foot. Um, the, the, the true value of seawater desalination and brackish water desalination in some degree is its reliability. So during periods of extended drought, that water is much more valuable to you than water that you're storing in a surface reservoir or stormwater that you're harvesting from, uh, from a river or something like that. And then the other advantage of desalination uh, is comes with the potential of blending. So you're producing water that's extremely clean. And in some cases, by blending it with water that is already slightly salty or has slightly elevated concentrations of uh, organic matter, which would form disinfection byproducts uh, in, in the, the water system, you can actually access water that with that is currently off limits without any additional treatment. So there are opportunities when you have desalination for uh, increased drought resilience and also uh, using that extremely clean water to improve the overall quality of water in, in a larger water system. And here in California, many of our uh, existing water systems need that low salinity water to uh, improve their quality and uh, aesthetics and uh and overall composition yeah i'm going to add that in some places like uh in the middle east for example where they have a lot of seawater desalination plants that folks are already exploring the idea of productizing the brine or or something which can be selectively removed from the brine of, mu of much higher value like magnesium or a, a bromide uh, for industrial uh, applications or even selling a clean sodium chloride brine uh, for the production of chlorine and, and caustic soda, things like that. Um, and in many cases, not every case, but in, but in many cases, you can actually make more money from selling those harvested products that you harvest from the brine can pay for the whole water treatment operation and 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 with profit on top. So um, I, I think some of the future direction is going to uh, involve uh, what some people refer to as valorizing what is traditionally viewed as a waste and squeezing as much clean fresh water out as we can and, and trying to extract value from high value constituents that may exist in that concentrated brine stream. Uh, I think we're we're pretty close to out of time. Um, and I, I think, you know, one last question for each panelist, um, it, is there like a technology that you're just absolutely excited about, or, or do you have a recommendation for the state specific recommendation about, um, desalination, uh, Reza, why don't you go first? Yes. I think, uh, as we discussed offline, we definitely need more research on the effect of uh, you know, coastal brine disposal on long-term studies to look at the effect of this in, uh, in longer times. So my advice for the state is allocating funds toward this. Good, and I'm gonna also suggest this like a lightning round, just 20, 30 seconds. Sunny, go. 
I have to find my button to unmute. <laughs> well, if I have to recommend to the state, I will say, well, you want it or you don't want it, desalination going to come um, because you're going to run out of water. And then so I would ask California to seriously consider that streamline the permitting process and uh, building the expert rather than making, you know, Dave mentioned that this is, became an argument which became a dissertation and then uh, we don't have time and the California need to put their effort and then and have streamlined that process to make things happen. Great. Megan? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would just encourage us to think about um, desalination more broadly than just seawater desalination. Um, there are lots of impacted water supplies uh, that are not available to us for uh, consumption or productive uh, agricultural or industrial use because of some specific contaminants of concern or because of some specific ions uh, that are at concentrations that, that don't really allow for uh, their use. So I think we need to be thinking about desalination as serving a broad set of non-traditional waters. Um, and we need to be thinking about those non-traditional waters as really helping to provide California a resilient water supply portfolio. Thanks, Megan. All right, David, last word. Yeah, California, you need to take this issue of legitimization more uh, seriously. Uh, on one end of the legitimization spectrum where the critics were listened to, where the science was done and the regulation was built in a way that addressed those issues, we have potable water reuse, which is going gangbusters in the state. And on the other end, we have nuclear power, which is shutting down at a time when the state might have been well served by having it. And those can be traced to a lack of uh, good stewardship by uh, by the legitimization process. And so we're at a critical point for desalination. And if we get it right, this could be something in our portfolio going into the future. That's great. Thank you, David. So we've come to the end of our time. Uh, and I'd really I'd like to thank the panel uh, for such a great conversation, the audience for for great questions. Uh, and CCST for putting this uh, event on. And now I'm going to hand it back to Sarah to, to close up. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And thank you very much to our panelists today for sharing your time and your expertise. You covered a lot of cutting edge information. I learned a lot. Thank you to our team at CCST for coordinating this briefing and for Bree for jumping in to finish my introduction today. And of course, thank you to everyone who joined us for any part of our Science and Technology Week this week in addition to this briefing. Um, you all provided some excellent questions. If you'd like to watch this briefing again uh, or have a colleague who was interested but couldn't make it, um, it will be posted on our website along with the one-pager and contact information for the experts you heard from today. Thank you, have a really good day.